Welcome to this introduction to tax and development. As you may have realized, taxation is not actually a very exciting subject most of the time. So I will try to keep you interested, but I can warn you now that I'm afraid there are very few good jokes about taxation. So don't wait for the jokes. These are the topics that I'm going to cover in this order. I won't linger on this. Let's start with the first one. Should governments try to raise more revenue? And I pose it in that way because there are a lot of people who think that it's somehow self-evident that the government should be raising more in taxes. It's not quite self-evident to me. Here are some reasons why governments might want to be raising more revenue. A uh, very popular suggestion in recent years has been the idea of financing all the public investments that will lead to uh, reaching the Millennium Development Goals. That's been a little bit on the back burner now, of course, because of the devastating impact of COVID-19 on so many countries. And so we now might now be talking rather of raising more revenue to finance the costs of COVID. But in fact, when many people talk about raising more revenue, um, they don't really have these purposes in mind. Partly they think somehow self-evidently a good thing. Or sometimes uh, they seem to think that it's a kind of sign of manliness, that you know, the more revenue a government uh, raises, then the more impressive it is as a government. And I think it's a good idea to start by realizing there is no shame in not collecting a high proportion of gross domestic product in tax revenue. And this is very important for poorer countries. And the reason is essentially that it's much easier to collect a lot of tax revenue from a rich economy where economic transactions are much better recorded, so many more transactions are online and digital, more firms keep detailed accounts and records, and many more employees have long-term formal contracts. Also in countries where there's a lot of international trade and in countries where very few farmers produce uh, mainly to feed themselves. I'm going to say a little bit more about this later in slide 24. But the point here is that there is quite a strong correlation between average per capita income in a country and the amount of tax that governments revenue raise. Sorry, The richer the country, the more tax they raise. So it's partly a structural issue. If we take that into account, and we actually look at what's called the tax effort, which is the effort that governments put in to raise revenue, if we take into account the fact that it's difficult for them to raise their revenue very often. Well, actually, many the governments of many low-income countries perform fairly well. So it's frankly a bit realis unrealistic and is not very helpful for someone in a low-income country to say, look, the governments of Western Europe, for example, collect 35 or 40 percent or more of their GDP in taxes, and uh, we only collect 15 percent. We should be able to do the same, with the implication that you're somehow failing. You're not failing necessarily. You may be, uh, but don't assume that you're failing. And the risk of that attitude is then a lot of effort is put into collecting more taxes. And one of the results of that is just the oppression and general bad treatment of taxpayers. So we need to ask the question, why is more revenue being raised? And it's not actually sensible to pressure to raise more if the government's unlikely to spend it well, 
if the burden of paying more is going to fall particularly heavily on poorer people, or if the pressure is going to lead tax collectors to raise more money by uh, really focusing too much on a small number of people and you know squeezing them too much to raise revenue from sources that they know. So be very aware of the sort of gung-ho attitude, more taxes, more taxes. And while we're talking of that, it's worth noting that there is, in many low-income countries, quite a widespread myth that there is this thing called the informal sector that is considerably undertaxed, and therefore you should get more revenue by taxing the informal sector. Whether or, that, or not that's true depends largely on what you mean by the informal sector. If you mean large numbers of very poor people trying to make a living by selling things in the street, for example, well, it's generally not sensible to try to tax them, formal or informal. If by the informal sector you mean larger scale business, that's uh, doing a great deal of its financing in cash rather than going through banks and is therefore hiding something, well, then you have a case. Um, but generally beware of the notion that tax the informal sector. So here we come to one of the biggest and most contentious issues in taxation, which is what about equity? Well, two general points to make. Most tax systems are either inequitable or very inequitable. There are very few in the world that I would regard as fair. Second, equity or fairness is central to almost all debates about taxation. We really value the idea of equity. Um, and there's also a general agreement, if you talk to people, you'll get a lot of agreement to the suggestion that the tax burden should fall on those people or companies with the ability to pay. But once we go beyond that, it's actually quite hard to get agreement on the specifics. And here are a few of the arguments that come up very commonly about equity, and I could give you many others. We can all agree that people with higher incomes should pay higher rates of income tax, for example. But how much higher should that be? A little bit or a lot? Um, we might start to disagree about whether wealth, as opposed to income, should be routinely taxed. Um, I think it should. I say a bit more about that in slide 17. But other people argue that no, wealth is the result of enterprise and effort and should be protected. Uh, more specifically, uh, when people sell their homes, uh, should they have to pay a substantial tax on the re-registration of their property in another name, in effect? Um, is that reasonable or is it unreasonable because it's their home? No agreement on that. Uh, if we look at what's called investment income, which is the income that I might get either from the business that I own and work in or from the dividends in, that I own in a particular company, should that be taxed less than the income I get from my job or should it be taxed more? Some people argue it should be taxed less because in going into business I've taken a risk and I should be rewarded for my risk. Other people radically disagree. Should the contributions I make to my personal retirement pensions be taxed or not? I have many views on that. Uh, should foreign companies be given some kind of tax reduction or exemption from investing in our country and therefore, in a sense, be given an advantage over local companies? A lot of scope for disagreeing on that. So we can disagree on the principle but if we begin to look a little bit more about the reality of taxation, the fact is that the actual sources of inequity are often very hidden behind both very complex laws, but also hidden behind the ways in which taxes are administered in practice. 
So here are just a few points to illustrate the importance of how the law is written, but also how taxes are collected. Um, imagine that uh, anyone who gets income from renting out a property is supposed to declare that and pay tax on that income if it's above a certain threshold. Well, if, as happens in some countries, the tax authority makes little effort to actually identify the very expensive properties in the capital city that are being rented out to foreign embassies and aid agencies and very large transnational companies and their staff. Well, what the tax agency is doing is actually making a decision about tax policy without saying so. Um, similarly, if the uh, tax authority puts very little effort into auditing, that means checking for accuracy, the income tax returns from people like high-earning medical consultants or lawyers, well, then they're encouraging these people to under-declare and effectively making a decision about tax policy because of the way they implement tax. Um, another practical issue that's very important, if the law doesn't allow tax authorities to ask for information about bank accounts and bank transactions, then it's making it much more difficult for tax authorities to actually check and cross-check who is earning what income and who has what assets. At a different level, we know that uh, transnational companies, companies operating in more than two, two countries, um, often have a great capacity to manipulate their accounts in any one country such that the profits that they earn in that country could either be artificially increased if they want to earn profits in that country or artificially decreased if they want to shift their profits to a tax haven somewhere else. Uh, it's very difficult for tax authorities to check this, but the amount of effort they put into checking also varies a great deal. And um, as another example, in many tax systems, um, the personal incomes that people earn uh, can be presented formally and legally as the profits of a company. And typically, company profits are taxed at lower rates than are high personal incomes. So people can get away with low taxation uh, because the law allows them to, in effect, pretend that uh, they are working on behalf of companies when they're really just working uh, in a direct employment relationship. So all this complexity and obscurity is a real problem for tax equity campaigners, those of us who believe that tax should be more fair and we should make more effort to make it fair. Here's just a couple of examples. Um, it's very common for tax campaigners to target value-added tax. Value-added tax is a tax on consumption and so it is uh, said to be regressive, that is impacting relatively more on poorer people than on richer people. And of course, the fact that it's promoted by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, doesn't help. In reality, in poor countries, uh, value-added tax, VAT, is actually rarely regressive. And it happens to be a good way for governments to collect revenue. So in most cases, it's not a good thing to campaign against. But it does, it's an easy thing to campaign against. Um, at a similar level in... Uh, there are typically many biases against women, especially small-scale uh, female entrepreneurs, in the tax systems of many countries. Um, but these are quite complex, and they really need to be identified. And too much of the campaigning about gender and taxation is based on taking a few simple ideas from rich countries and applying them to poor countries. Uh, you'll, there's a separate lecture on gender and tax that will tell you more about that. I'm just at this point uh, giving a general warning about being too enthusiastic about campaigning against the simple things. So here are a few principles for tax campaigners. 
Um, first, it's better to assume that all tax systems are actually less equitable than they appear on the surface. That's going to be true 99% of the time, if not 100%. Second, it is very useful to push for transparency about all aspects of taxation. But as a tax campaigning organisation, you're going to have to generate some of that transparency yourself. Governments are not going to uh, give it to you very willingly, so you're going to have to connect to researchers and promote research and find out what's really going on, as opposed to what government says is going on. Fourthly, be a bit careful about focusing too much on the apparent inequity of any single tax. Because all governments collect a wide range of different taxes, and some of those taxes individually are quite uh, equitable or um, progressive, and some are inequitable or non-progressive. But their overall impact on society depends not just on uh, their impact when they're collected, but it depends on their impact when they're spent. And it's quite possible for a tax which is actually quite fairly regressive when it's collected to, in practice, contribute so much to spending that benefits poor people that it is overall progressive. So you need to look at the system and don't look too much at individual taxes. And the fifth point of which, again, there is in fact a separate lecture, is that in many low-income countries, in addition to the national formal tax system, there are a whole lot of subnational and informal tax systems that are often uh, particularly problematic and need attention. But that's a point for the separate lecture. At this point, uh, if you like to take a break, um, do that and absorb what was there before. I will carry straight on recording and go into the slightly more complicated question of how does taxation connect to good governance. There's a quotation from here, here and the quotation summarises a fairly common view. Here's the quotation. Taxes establish a direct and accountable relationship between a government and its citizenry. When people pay taxes, they expect their governments to de deliver and they hold government institutions to account. So if you look at this carefully, this sounds like an argument for more taxes. Uh, if we levy more taxes, then we all get more accountable, better governance. Well, is this true? Well, my answer you see here is a kind of um, ambiguous, uh, to some extent, probably yes. Um, I think it is probably yes on balance, but it is not clear and it's not obviously true in every case. And the issues behind this, frankly, are very complex and I'm not going to go into them in great detail here. But... Um, one of the ways of really kind of cutting a little bit into what this is all about is to pose this question. What does a government need to do? or How does it need to relate to its citizens and its businesses when it's raising its revenue? And I'm just going to pose this as two alternative options. And I'm going to call the first one government's earned income. In other words, the idea is that government has to actually work hard to get its revenue. Government's going to have to work hard if um, it needs to put a lot of effort into identifying and registering sources of revenue. You know, who owns what business? Who has what job? Who has what bank accounts? Who owns what properties? Um, who is... Um, just passing on a lot of money and in inheritance to their daughters and sons, etc. So they've got to identify that. Secondly, if uh, governments are at least tempted to support and nurture those sources of revenue on the grounds that they will, those sources of revenue will become juicy, they'll become better. And thirdly, on the grounds that government will then have to persuade people to pay their taxes without too much resistance. 
if governments have to do all those things, then I think we should call that government's revenue earned income. And governments are particularly likely to have to do all those things if they don't have one or two major sources of revenue, but they have to really work across the board um, and contact most of their businesses, most of their employed people, most of their wealthy, etc. But there are quite a few governments in the world that get a lot of their income in what I'm calling an unearned way. And unearned means they don't really have to put a lot of effort in. And uh, this will happen in particular where government, for example, in effect controls whether or not it owns a few large mines or a few large oil wells or a few large natural gas fields, or to a lesser extent, uh, whether government actually happens to control a major international shipping canal um, or uh, military bases that can be le uh, leased out to foreigners, etc., or large amounts of foreign aid that are given without any concern in, at how they're spent. We'll call these sources of unearned income. And what we know most clearly is that governments that depend heavily on unearned income, and that in practice for poor governments, means governments that depend largely on the extraction and export of minerals of various kinds of oil and gas, tend to be bad governments. They tend to be unaccountable and they spend their, they tend to be exclusive, undemocratic, and they spend their money in ways that don't benefit the population. Conversely, if governments depend on earned income, it is more likely on average that um, citizens and business will want something in return for those taxes, like better services or more influence on government policy, or more government accountability, and they are more likely to engage with government and uh, make some effort to get what they want. So there's likely to be some productive uh, political relationships here. But how well that linkage works depends on a lot of factors. It works well in some cases and badly in others. And the policy message, well, the two policy message, messages, the first one is don't believe that in the short term, which means in a few years or maybe more than a few years, increases in taxes are going to lead to better or more accountable government. They might just, or they might just to a small extent, but you can't rely on that as a mechanism. The second policy conclusion is that if you want to do something about this in policy terms, well, focus on making your tax systems more fair, more efficient, more transparent, more user-friendly, and that is actually quite a good way of improving governance generally rather than saying, well, if we, if we increase taxes, then we should get better governments at some point. So there's much more that could be said about that, but I think that is enough for the present. And I now want to come on to the, if you like, more nitty gritty question about what should actually be taxed. And I'm giving you a list here, which is a list of priorities. I'm saying if you go from A through to F here, you should start by taxing A and then go to B and C and D and E and then through to F. So you only finally get to taxing F if you really think you can't sensibly raise enough revenue from these other sources. Now, this is to some extent my personal list. Other people may... Uh, Put things differently. I will we'll go through these and I will explain at each point what I mean by these titles. And we're starting with the idea of societal bads. That simply means things that we don't want people to do because they are bad things. Um, but they're also bad things that we can tax as opposed to bad things like uh, theft and crime that uh, have to be punished or discouraged in some other way. 
So we're going to be um, taxing these societal bads, um, partly because it raises us some money, but particularly because it raises us some money and discourages people from doing these things. And indeed, ideally, it discourages them so much that they stop doing them entirely, and eventually we stop raising money from this source. Um, that's nothing, there's nothing too much to worry about there because there are always new bads to tax. So if an old bad is driven out by taxation, not a problem. Well, here is a list that I think most people would agree with of some of the most common bads that exist in our societies today and bads that could reasonably be taxed. And the first ones are fossil fuels and all the emissions and the global warming to which they give rise. Um, and second, and more explicitly, um, emissions of both methane and carbon dioxide from other sources uh, not exclusive of fossil fuels. And thirdly, and related to fossil fuels, is air pollution of various kinds. Uh, which causes a lot of health damage. Fourthly, tobacco. Tobacco is an extremely poisonous and extremely addictive substance that should never have been released on the world. Um, and the more we tax it, uh, the better off uh, is society, because we have to spend less time on repairing the damages of this poison, and the better off are the people, ultimately, who would otherwise be consuming tobacco. Um, Drinks with a whole lot of sugar in them, similar, not quite so nasty, but a major cause of obesity. Alcohol, yeah, to some extent, um, can be very problematic. And then you might add things like, well, why don't we just tax vehicles um, for the amount of time they spend on the road, because road use is a problem. And you could add many other societal bads. Um, there are all kinds of challenges about how you tax these specific bads. And those at the top of the list, fossil fuels and emissions, are very much on policy agendas these days. But we can generally agree these are very good things to tax. The second things we would tax are what I'm calling rents, what most people call rents. But this is a bit of a technical term and it's not rents in the sense of the money you pay every month uh, to hire a room or a flat from a landlord. These are rents in the economist sense, and rents are technically the difference between the income that I earn from a resource that I control, like an oil well, and the income that I would actually need to earn from that resource to persuade me to keep it into, in production. A uh, very simple example, if I control an oil well these days, I can sell a barrel of oil for about $70. There are many countries where it's costing me, let's say, $10 or less to actually produce a barrel of oil. So my rent is um, almost $70. So almost $60 there. We'll allow a little bit for normal profit. So if a government came along and said, well, I'm going to tax $50 away from the value of your oil, that's going to leave you $20. I, as the oil well owner, would actually carry on producing oil, because I'm still doing very nicely, thank you, and government would be earning um, a great deal of money. And in principle, um, as long as we assume that uh, natural resources, especially oil, gas and minerals, should belong to society and therefore be controlled by government, rather than belong to individuals. Uh, in principle, governments should be taxing as much of the rent as they can, because it's a good source of income, and uh, it's not going to reduce economic activity. Uh, unfortunately, most low-income governments, for basically reasons of politics, find it very difficult to tax natural resource extraction at anything like this level. Um, but if they did, they could. there are many other things they could tax less. So that's rents. Um, if we still need some more revenue after 
taxing um, bads and then rents, we can look at wealth. Generally speaking, when you're taxing wealth, it's unlikely that you're going to seriously deter people from economic activity and from accumulation. The idea that um, somehow people are going to stop acquiring large amounts of wealth because they're going to have to pay some of it to government in taxes is um, it's mostly just not plausible. And indeed, in some contexts, actually taxing wealth might encourage people to make good use of it rather than hoarding it. And land is a classic case. People sometimes invest in land when they have a lot of money because they know land is not being produced anymore and its value will go up. Um, but in the meantime, they don't use it. And it might be actually good for society if that land were used, either used more productive, productively for agriculture or used for housing or some other non-agricultural purpose. And a tax on wealth might encourage rich people to actually make use of that uh, wealth that they're hoarding. So don't worry too much about the effect of taxes on wealth on the economy, um, but you know, just bear that in mind. So avoid taxing wealth where it might reduce economic activity. But note that the big problem in taxing wealth is actually locating and valuing it. And that's especially a problem because so much wealth is and can be transferred across borders. And of course, it can take all kinds of uh, sort of intangible forms, including uh, bits of paper giving you claims to financial assets elsewhere in the world, as well as things like uh, major artworks, which are very easy to hide and store away. Fourthly, there are a wide range of wealth taxes um, the most comprehensive is an annual levy, uh, in other words, a levy that you charge every year on the total value of family or personal wealth. So you might accumulate information on all sources of wealth, value it this year, and then say charge half a percent or one percent on that. Alternatives include property taxes, um, taxes on capital gains, uh, inheritance taxes and gift taxes. And let's not forget zakat, um, which is a tax on wealth um, mandated in Islam. And um, if uh, zakat were more widely and generally collected, it would um, contribute importantly to wealth taxation in the world. And generally speaking, wealth is greatly undertaxed in almost all countries in the world. So if we can't, still can't get enough from wealth, we come along to spending. And I'm not, I'm not very keen on actually taxing spending. Um, we tax spending or consumption partly as a sort of backup because we can't always tax incomes very fully or very comprehensively. So, you know, taxing spending is like a second bite at the same thing. If you didn't get it at the point of incomes, well, you can get it at the point of consumption. Uh, plus, there is an argument that says if you tax spending, you actually encourage people to save and invest, which might be good for the economy. So uh, in the world today, the dominant tax on consumption or spending is value added tax. It's mostly replaced sales taxes. It's a big source of revenue for almost all governments in the world. Other common taxes on spending are what we call excise taxes, specific taxes on tobacco, alcohol and fuel. Now, consumption taxes are potentially problematic because they fall more on poorer people than on richer people. So we have to be careful. But as I suggested earlier, in most countries in the world, um, value added tax, although a consumption tax is not much biased and sometimes not biased at all against poor people. Uh, there are a range of technical reasons for that. But the most simple is that food, which is the tax, this is the item that poor people consume a lot of, tends to be exempt from VAT in most countries. So don't be too nervous about VAT. 
think about consumption taxes more generally if you have to. Um, but there are, they're not the best source of revenue if we have better options. Cross-border trade. Well, it's interesting. This is the classic historic source of government revenue. Basically because it's fairly easy to intercept physical goods as they cross international borders and indeed historically often internal borders between provinces or states within countries. And this historically was a major source of government revenue. In the contemporary world, uh, exports are very rarely taxed, so we can say that there are almost no taxes on exports and taxes on imports have been much declining in incidence for quite a long time. So they are generally reducing. There is one big argument against uh, cross-border taxes of any kind, which is an economic argument that they really discourage countries from specialising a bit in the economic activities that they're best at. But the case for and against border taxes is really complicated because there's another argument in favour of border taxes which can be powerful and it's not an argument about tax and revenue at all, but it's about what we call industrial policy. Essentially, if you want to promote certain kinds of industry, often called infant ind industries in a country, well, one of the best ways of helping to do that is to place uh, taxes on imports of that product for a fixed period of time. So that's called giving protection. So giving protection to infant industries is a good, uh, not, it should never be the sole way of promoting a particular industrial sector, but it can be a, a good ancillary way of doing it. So whether or not you should and how much you should collect from cross-border trade depends a lot on the relevance of that argument to your country. And the final thing we should look at is incomes. And it's quite interesting. Uh, I know when I talk to people about taxes, so many people immediately assume that taxes and taxation is about taxing incomes. Um, and they're not entirely wrong, because a lot of taxation is about taxing incomes, and I'll show you some figures on that in a minute. Um, but it shouldn't be. I mean, income should be actually one of the last things we should tax. Because by definition, if you tax something, you discourage it. So, you know, Try to avoid taxing incomes too much. Um, and uh, most countries would be better if we tax incomes less and we tax those other things higher in the list more. But having said that, we should be very aware that in many countries, especially but not only poorer countries, people earning high incomes often really are undertaxed. They manage to evade and avoid income tax in various ways. So there is a significant problem there. Uh, but the problem is not general income taxation. As a matter of fact, the governments of richer countries get a lot of their revenue from taxing incomes, but particularly taxing personal income. And the basic way they do that is that they persuade employers to deduct that tax at source every month before the employers pay salaries to their employees. That's called pay, P-A-Y-E. Uh, that generates a lot of revenue. And I'll show you that in a minute. As I mentioned earlier, um, Companies that uh, operate transnationally often find it relatively easy to avoid paying corporate income tax. So let's just uh, conclude here by looking at a few figures. I've just taken in these two columns all uh, low-income countries and at the complete opposite high-income OECD countries. I've missed out middle-income countries just to make the picture clear. And you can see some of the differences there for yourselves. Take your time and look at the table. I'm just at this point going to draw attention to the bottom row, row I 
ratio of corporate income tax to personal income tax revenue, with the figures in red. And this essentially tells you that in high income OECD countries, governments get more than three times as much revenue from personal income taxes as they do from corporate income taxes. Whereas the situation in low income countries is uh, almost the opposite and governments on average get appreciably more revenue from corporate income tax than they do from personal income taxes. Uh, there's no obvious policy conclusion from there, but there is at least a strong hint that you might want to be a little careful about uh, loading much more on corporate income tax in many low income countries. You might now again want to take a little break because there was a lot in that last section. I'm going on now to talk about what is actually taxed as opposed to what we would like to be taxed and a little bit about why. And I'm going to simplify this by saying that there are two broad reasons why what's actually taxed is very different from what should be taxed. And the first and the most important um, and the most complex and diverse is just politics of all kinds. Taxation is very political. Uh, the second one, which we can separate out, is what I'm calling administrative constraints. And the central point here is that governments, and especially governments in lower income countries, are often face a lot of constraints in what they can actually tax. And so what they do tax is often what they can tax, as opposed to what, in principle, they would like to tax. So, politics. Well, there's so much I could say here that I'm not going to give you an overall view. I just want to give you a few examples of how I think politics impacts on taxation. In the first place, people involved in writing tax law and tax principles, the lawyers, the legislators and the lobbyists, to some extent actually make tax complicated in terms of the wording, the law, the procedure, deliberately and intentionally to hide the many loopholes that exist to benefit the powerful and well-connected uh, provided those powerful and well-connected are advised by lawyers and lobbyists. And this is just here one very small example. Uh, this is true in my country, Britain and the United States, as a concept of carried interest. This effectively means that very, very wealthy people who are partners in private investment funds and get income from their partnership of a private investment fund are able to get their income treated as capital gains for tax purposes and capital gains are taxed at a much lower rate than our, um, is income. And we're talking here of people who might be earning many millions of pounds or dollars every year. So this little, you know, Tweaking of the law has enormous implications for a small number of people. A second point, which I think fairly obvious, is that uh, politics matters because governments use their control over the tax system and the allocation of the tax burden in order to get political support of various kinds from influential people, including influential people who can give political donations. So classically, um, giving selective tax exemptions to particular companies or particular businesses is a very good way of uh, getting political support and actually giving away, in practice, a lot of real tax revenue. So the question is point three, why do so many people, small groups, get away with um, manipulating the tax system and manipulating their political connections? Uh, that they, a very small group, get a big advantage 
Well, the general answer to that is that um, small groups can put a lot of effort and it's rational for them to put a lot of effort into getting those small changes in legislation that advantage them. Whereas the rest of us, um, we really don't see that. Uh, we don't pay a lot of attention, none of us pay much attention to the, the enormously complex details of new tax legislation. Um, we, as individuals, as ordinary people, we are not going to be affected very much. We don't mostly understand how we're going to be affected and nobody tells us. And anyway, it's going to be at some point in the future and it's not today. So this is a classic case of where uh, politics does advantage, advantage small people and small people like complexity. But let's conclude by saying that uh, the people involved in trying to uh, change tax policy and especially shift taxes away from them, uh, along with governments very often, are past masters that the using the power of rhetoric just to label certain taxes in a certain way to make them sound like bad things, whereas in fact they're very good things. So if we take, for example, of inheritance taxes, uh, the taxes that uh, people pay when they die and they pass on large amounts of money to uh, their family, kin and friends, etc. In so many countries, these are labelled death taxes, which makes them sound really bad. They sound heartless. Someone's died and then you want to tax them. Uh, this ensures that, you know, very large estates are handed on from generation to generation when they shouldn't be. Uh, similarly, property taxes, and property is undertaxed almost throughout the world. Um, there is again a separate uh, lecture on property taxes. Property taxes are talked of as a taxing poor widows um, because uh, selective examples are taken of uh, poor widows or hypothetical examples of poor widows living in large houses that they can't really afford to maintain properly. Uh, but they don't want to move because they've lived there all their life and you shouldn't be heartless enough now to charge significant property taxes on their big houses. Well, you know, that is not, that's not reasonable. Um, capital gains tax on people selling their houses, their main residence, that's called taxing homes. And homes is a sort of sacred idea and you shouldn't tax homes. Well, any government that's actually introducing capital gains tax on selling homes is not introducing it on the average person. They're only introducing it on people who own really large houses who should be paying those taxes. Taxes on agriculture. Most of the world, farmers manage to get taxed less than most other people in similar businesses. And... Uh, there's an argument here about taxing food. When you're talking about taxing farmers, no, no, why would you want to tax food? Everyone needs food, etc. And so this is used in a very self-interested way. And uh, on a slightly different note, um, it's very, I mean, it's standard that when we get incomes, we should pay taxes of them on them. And then when we buy things in shops, uh, we pay some kind of consumption or sales tax. Um, but people arguing against taxes say this is double taxation. The same thing is being taxed tw twice. Well, actually, it's not really the same thing and it's not really being taxed twice. OK, administrative constraints. Well, this is a little more complex. I'll try again to not to go into the details, but get to the heart of this. And it's easiest to get to the heart of this if we think in terms of history and the historical trajectory. The further we go back in history, the further you find that governments raised their taxes as a result of creating themselves tax opportunities, what we call tax handles. So the way they created tax opportunities would be, uh, for example, first, they say, well, if any goods cross borders, either international borders or even internal borders within a country, then you've got to pay something. Um, so they just station armed people at the borders and you pay. Uh, 
Uh, secondly, governments often took themselves or sold to someone else a monopoly on, say, the production or the import or the sale of some uh, valuable, scarce, important commodity like salt or tobacco or alcohol. Um, and just made sure that if you were consuming that, uh, you then had to, uh, at some point, you had to go through a, a tax collector. Um, thirdly, they would put special taxes on highly visible luxuries, and there's the famous case that people often quote, there was a small point in British history when the government was desperate for money, and it actually put a tax on windows in houses, on the perfectly reasonable grounds that bigger houses had more windows and would therefore pay more tax. Um, fourthly, governments create the need because they pass an administrative ordinance that says that for certain purposes you need certain documents and to get those documents uh, you need to pay something to government and those documents can be almost anything they can be a passport they can be a certification uh, that your property has been transferred from one person to another um, they could be your certification of your uh, high school education they could be your registration of a car or whatever. Sorry, go back. So that's the history. But as we move more and more into what we can call the modern world, then increasingly economic transactions and economic assets are getting recorded. Um, they're becoming accessible to more people, including governments, and they're also increasingly now becoming digitalized, which means they can be accessed very easily and the information can be transferred very quickly. And the more we have those transactions and assets recorded, accessible and digitalized, the easier it is for governments to do really three things. First is to collect their revenues indirectly, not by going to a business and saying, oh, I see you seem to be manufacturing a lot of soap here, um, you need to pay some revenues, but just looking at the records. Secondly, separating out the business of assessment, that's saying how much tax you need to collect from actually collecting the money. Because you can look at the records of the soap business and someone in the tax office can say the soap business uh, needs to pay so many um, thousand shillings this year and someone else in the tax office in a completely separate part is handed the responsibility of then collecting those so many thousand shillings. And if you separate those two, you can greatly reduce corruption in tax collection. And so governments can collect revenues indirectly, they can separate assessment from collection and they can actually then collect more money. And this goes back to slide four, when I explained the difference between poor and rich countries. The reason that governments of rich countries raise more revenue is principally because governments are in a better position in terms of the recording and the accessibility and the digitalization of the relevant information. And uh, point four, just to be a little more precise, if you think what is the, um, the use of additional data, especially digital data, if you're a tax administration? Well, here are two things uh, you can do very easily um, with digitization. First is that you can take the tax declarations of Mick Moore, for example, when he declares his uh, income tax every year, and you can go for what's called third-party data. And you can see um, whether that third-party data is consistent with what Mick Moore declared. You can look at his bank account, his um, transactions, and how much money he has in there. You can look at his electricity and his water bills, which will give you some hint of whether he's got a really super big house or whether he looks as if he's running a large manufacturing business in the back of his house that he's not declaring. You can look at his vehicle purchases. If he's buying a lot of large Mercedes cars, then you that's a strong hint that he's probably got more money than he's declaring. Um, you can look at the uh, 
records of company secretaries when they send out the dividends. And you can find out whether Mick Moore has actually got a lot of shares in a company or many companies and getting dividends that he's not declaring, etc. And you know, you've got passports. If he's got a has he got a passport? Well, if it was a poor country, uh, anyone with a passport is um, you know, it's a question. Why has he got a passport? Has he got more money than he declares? So you can check that information, but even at an earlier stage, um, you can use the principle of withholding. Um, which is essentially means that before the tax that's due actually gets into the pocket of the person who's supposed to pay it, someone else withholds it and then takes it to government. So the classic case of this that I mentioned earlier is personal income taxes through the pay-as-you-earn system. So my employer every year sends, sorry, every month sends me a statement of my monthly salary and that includes a statement of the estimated amount of income tax due that year, that month, that's been taken straight out of my salary and given straight to the government and never gets to me. And we can, the same thing can be done with uh, many other economic activities. So the concluding point about this is that if you think high taxation is a good thing, you should bear in mind that there is an almost inevitable connection between high levels of taxation and government knowing more about you. you know, high taxation does have a very big brother element to it. And here we are, some conclusions. Number one, tax is simultaneously, it's very political, and it's a complex and it's a rather inaccessible territory, enmeshed in law, procedure, privacy, and sometimes some rather difficult economic arguments. So, you know, tax almost by its nature tends to be obscure, and some people want to keep it obscure. And we can't generally rely on governments um, to either make it more accessible or to make the efforts we would like to make for, to make taxation more fair. So campaigning in the public interest is vital if we want better tax systems. But it does need to be informed campaigning because as I said earlier it's easy to uh, campaign against things that are simple and misleading or possibly wrong. And finally and uh, Perhaps most importantly, there are still no good jokes about taxation. So if you happen to come across any, I'd be very grateful if you would uh, send them to me. Thank you very much.